This video starts with all the stuff open because this is take two and there's a good reason for that. This is an interesting device that has suddenly become obsolete. It's called the Smart App, which is a play on Smart Tap because in the UK we call it a, a faucet a tap. That's uh, the little thing that you just turn and water comes out. And the idea about this is uh, it's an internet, internet, well, it was an internet connected thing until the server got taken down when the company probably got into financial difficulties, I'd guess. But uh, this is take two, and the reason for take two is because I've gone much further this time, because it was just a fairly shallow investigation of what was inside. But now I've got pictures of all the circuit boards and everything, so we can explore it a lot deeper. So here is the idea. We have this big module here which has a water inlet here for hot and cold water, one at either side, and then it has three outlets. One goes to your bath tap, one goes to your or spout, one goes to your shower, and one possibly goes to a wash hand basin or something. I'm not really sure. But you have these controls here, or you can simply talk. You can use your home assistant device to talk to your shower and say, turn shower on at 40 degrees Celsius, and it'll turn on in readiness for you to step into the shower. This also means that theoretically when things go horribly wrong because it is inter internet connected via remote server, that means a hacker can also say, turn your shower on at a random temperature. And if the shower curtain is open or the door is open or it's just pointing out, it could flood your house remotely. Isn't that brilliant? Or just flush gallons of water down the drain. So the control is done with these two plates. Now, I'll turn the lights on. And you can see these in their full... No, I actually tell you what. I'll turn the power on to this and you'll see it goes through its initialization procedure. Since I got it, it's developed a quirk. It's not quite finding a position for one of these. Uh, so these are the two half-turn, uh, probably ceramic taps. Not really sure what's inside. So they're kind of initializing, making lots of robotic noises. And then one of them just keeps making a loud powering noise and the power goes up to about 6 watts and it just never finds what it's looking for. But anyway, um, given what I've seen inside here, I'll show you what's inside here. Uh, it's quite rusty is what's inside there. I get the feeling that this unit may have been mounted upside down as such with the pipes all coming out the top. I don't know the official way of mounting it. The text is up this way. I think all pipes should go down the way. It doesn't really matter. Uh, if you buy one of these, you're not going to have full functionality. So now it's initialized. Well, I'll show you the taps going. So I'll just push this button and lots of uh, motorized noises as it adjusts the temperature. It's got a temperature sensor in here, uh, probably a, a safety temperature sensor in here. And then it's got the coupling on from two geared motors and the three solenoid valves to the outputs. Now, if I turn the light off, I take exposure off and I take the light off. You can see the buttons here. And as you turn the rotary encoder to the left, it goes bluer. The slight sweep you can see of colour going through is just the sort of interaction with the with the um, camera. Um, and if you turn it to the right, you can make it go red and it shows that it's reached the end of its limit. Does it do that when you go to the other end? You've reached the end. No, it doesn't. It just shows you you've run it right up to the super duper hot level. What about this one? This can choose between your shower or your bath tap, and if you rotate it, it changes the flow, I think. This one, I haven't a clue. This one might be the sink. And if you turn it to the left, it can change the temperature, which seems to be reflected over there. And then if you press it, it over right, it turns your shower off. Okay, so... Someone coming in and washing their hands while you're having a shower wouldn't be a great result. Right, okay. You've seen it operating. Let's uh, take a closer look. Oh, one thing. This is important. If I push this button in gently, nothing happens, right? It did happen. That's because I released it quickly. But watch this. If I push it in gently and release it gently... Oh, it's not doing it now. Oh... It was doing it earlier on, but not to worry, I'll show you why that is, that it does the thing that I thought it was going to do. Right, tell you what, watch your eyes, the light is about to come back. The light is back, it is still trying to find what it's looking for. Um, 
So I'll turn the power off now and watch this. Actually, you know what? Yes, yes, I'll do it. I'll turn the power off, watch the taps. It goes quiet because now the voltage is going down. It's only about 13 and a half volts it operates at. And then, after a while, it gently winds that tap round to the end of travel. And it's running off battery right now. A lithium battery that is designed to turn the taps off if uh, the power fails. And you may hear, I don't know if you're going to hear it with this one, you may hear ramp up in frequency. I think it's already done it, um, as it's just basically testing for movement of the uh, motors. Right, tell you what then, let's take this to bits. Well, I've taken it to bits. So the people who have these uh, have no longer got app control over them because the server's gone down. They can still control it by pushing the button and rotating it for the temperature. But uh, people didn't seem too happy about that. So this very expensive £800 adapter for your bath, plus the installation charges, is now just a very basic tap control, in which case you're better with taps. Um, what else? Uh, one of the, my favourite reviews of this was a lady saying that uh, she had to have it removed or something like that because uh, every time she went in and used the home assistant to turn the light on in the bathroom, the shower came on at the same time. So it's kind of important to get somebody who really knows how to do up the network as well as electrics, as well as the plumbing. Now, this thing is full of water. It's got precipitation of water. I wonder if it's been lying flat. Uh, not sure. Anyway, let's undo some of these connectors. This was all incidentally in a box, quite neat. Uh, there's the... PP3 lithium cell that is used to run the motors and processor when the system is uh, powered down unexpectedly. The circuit board in here, quite nicely, comes off a little marshalling header. Oh, actually, hold on, before I do that, there's one other connector you have to pull off. And then it comes off the marshalling header like that, which is quite neat. And that uh, has the outputs to all the solenoid valves. Um. So before I go into electronics here, let's unplug the electronics, get them out of the way. Let's pull all the connectors off. There we go. That's uh, that's the little processor in there. It's quite neat. I particularly like the marshalling connector here, which also means that uh, as well as saving space in the circuit board and allowing a nice controlled right angle turn for the connectors, it means that if you have to change the board in this, it, you can do that fairly easily by unclipping it, pulling it out, um, Remove your connector here and then just basically you can slot a new card on, which is quite neat. Right, let's take a look at the valve system. Can I undo these little connectors? I think it'd be useful to undo these connectors because it might let me get in deeper. Is that going to come out? The excruciating time it takes to do these fruity little connectors. There's one. I shall use brute force just spin it there we go now to remove this assembly you turn this pin right and as you turn the pin it literally just you could just pull it up to be honest because all it does is it rides up a wee ramp and it's got a couple of o-rings here and it really just it's a friction fit that just pushes down through a hole in the back when you've done that it basically uncouples from the taps uh, which are very loose but I, I've feel that these have been leaking. I can actually see a little wick of water in there. When you unclip the cover off this, right, tell you what, before, let's clear the space, right? Let's clear the space. So you've seen this with all its uh, solenoid valves going to the output. You've seen the temperature sensor block. You've seen the, the little taps, the little facets, um, and the little regulator and water mixer and stuff like that. Let's get that out of the way. Well, this, incidentally, is the little Wi-Fi module. Uh, can I? Yes, I can. I can just take the whole lot out of the way now. No, I'll have to take that network cable off. God, so much stuff. That's us. What's the bet the Wi-Fi module contains a little ESP? It is sealed shut. This box can also go... Right, what was I going to look at there? This, the motor. Right, okay. If I pop the end off here, to gain access to the motor assembly, the first thing I see is just tons of rust in there. Like, lots of rust. 
Here are the two motors with encoders. I'm not sure they're supposed to come out. Hold on, let's get a pair of long nose pliers and just apply some upward pressure on this. There, that's what we're looking for. That's what we're looking for. And get a screwdriver. Oh, that's not the screwdriver I want. Hold on. And what have I been doing with this screwdriver? Oh, I've been poking it into foam. That's what I've been doing with it. Lovely. Messy. Uh, is this the one I need as well? No, I don't think it is. Let's use this one. Let's see if we can get one of these motors out, because uh, they seem to be attached in here. Now, I could see that, although it had reached the end of... Uh, it seemed to be rotating in that, but I don't see how it could rotate in that. It just seemed to almost like... I don't know why it wasn't detecting that it wasn't the end of travel. Maybe water has got into the encoder. It looks a fairly standard motor encoder gearbox combo, as seen in some of the lights I've worked on in the past. So this comes out. Oh yes, I can feel it moving. Oh, it's not going to come out, is it, because of this? Is this a plug? Yes, it's a plug. It's going to come out. That's an end cap. Seen a bit more than I expected here. No, oh, one screw's still holding in. There we are. Uh... Well, that's not great, is it? Do you think this stuff, this rust all caked round encoder might have been part of this year? It looks as though it's a magnetic, it is a magnetic encoder. With rust on it. That may be why it wasn't really finding its index position. And another reason that you really shouldn't mount these with the pipes pointing up the way. I bet it says that in the manual, you're not supposed to do it. But anyway, 12 volt DC, 34 RPM, that's a shame. Anyway, I'm going to just wash this off my fingers now. One moment, please. Ah, yes. Never underestimate the ability to, of water to just creep in everywhere. No matter what you do to try and keep it out, it will end up creeping in. I do think that unit must have been mounted to the pipes pointing up the way. I'm also guessing that it was designed for plastic pipes because the it's one of those push-fit ones and it's got an O-ring and then it's got a little uh, stainless steel grip at the other side that if you pushed copper pipe in, the copper would be gripped with the stainless steel but it would be submerged in water, so it must be for plastic, I'm guessing. Anyway, let's take a look at these. These are on a little serial network, which I have a sneaky feeling is actually RS-232. And if you take a look at these taps... By popping this off, there's a little circuit board with a set of four LEDs and a rotary magnetic sensor that uses the Hall effect. It's also got an inductor in the back that I think is used to detect the button being pressed by the sudden transition of magnetic field. That's what I was trying to show earlier on. It just completely failed to show it. If you pull the knob off the front, uh, this is just a magnet in there. And it's detecting the north and south orientation is what allows it to detect rotation. And uh, it's when you push it in, it's somehow detecting. I don't know if it's the chips doing that or that inductor. But it's detecting the, the sudden movement of that magnet, the sudden change of magnetic flux. Right. Interesting. Oh, and the indentation, the sort of clicking effect as you rotate it, is strictly built into the knob. It's just a, it's just a tactile feel for people go. Oh, yeah, tactile. Mm, yes. Anyway, right, at this point in time, I'm going to get the pictures. I shall do that right now. One moment, please. So let's explore the circuitry, what we can see of it. So on this side of the circuit board, we have the main processor. It's an ARM STM32F103. Uh, we've also got what looks like a bit of power supply circuitry up here with an inductor and a little uh, chip. I'm guessing that's power supply. This definitely looks like a little voltage regulator. We also have uh, some uh, what look like PTC fuses. Uh, one for the lithium cell over here, which is a non-rechargeable lithium cell. It is literally, this is inside, and if this goes 1,200 milliamp power, I don't think it's rechargeable. I think it's just a fixed unit. But it'll have a good lifespan, although it says 2027. Is that its expiry date? I don't know. Uh, we've got some what look like snubber networks here. For This is the two outputs to the motor with encoders, and these are three outputs to the three solenoid valves. 
This little chip here, from the look of it, it's a protected RS-232 network driver. Uh, 4551B, I wonder if that's a standard CMOS chip. If it is, it's just multiplexing and stuff like that. Uh, what about the other side? On the other side we have the more interesting stuff. Now that, I'll turn it upside down. No, I won't turn it upside down. I'll just leave it this way. Um, there's the edge connector that's quite handy for connecting. I'm not sure what this is. 4W469A or ATH444. That didn't come up with much, but I think that's behind the microcontroller. So it might possibly... Hold on, let me just think of this. It is behind the microcontroller. So maybe it's a memory chip. Don't know. Um, we have another of those serial chips. I'm not sure why that is. And we have these uh, inductors here that uh, are presumably filtering for something, maybe for external power. Those uh, four diodes are the shunt diodes for, for protection, I'm guessing, for the... Uh, the solenoid valves, and this is a hex addressable hex driver for those solenoid valves. This big chip here is for the two motors. It's a dual H bridge driver. Uh, there's some more protection diodes on that. Um, what else? Not a huge amount more. We've got two of those chips one DI1 drew a blank, as did ZA5812. The ZA5812, I'm pretty sure that did find a match, but for a completely different chip number. Um, and uh, it was vague, it was a Chinese site that just didn't really give much information. Let's take a look at the little rotary encoders. The main thing in the rotary encoders is we've got the one, two, three, four LEDs, and we've got two sets of transistors here. One of these sets of transistors is connected to that LED, and I'm guessing maybe they're just being run as two pairs, and that's why they've got six transistors. Maybe they wanted to be able to do alternate fancy things. There is a chip here. Let me just turn this around. Is that 369ABBB? This is a chip that... Uh, detects the rotating magnetic field. That's what uh, is the rotary encoder. I don't think it detects increasing magnetic field because on the other side of the circuit board, if we covered everything here, we've got the four LEDs, we've got this uh, rotary encoder detection chip. It's a Hall Effect chip. And we've got the LED driver uh, transistors, which is, I think, what they are. Uh, on the other side, we've got the microcontroller hiding under a sticker. Presumably, it's specific to each of the buttons. We've got a... Uh, solid state uh, fuse, a PTC fuse here. There is this inductor. I'm wondering if the inductor is the bit that detects you pushing the button and it sees the significant change in the field. There is a little chip here that might have been um, either a power supply with that inductor there, is it? Or could it have been a little amplifier for this inductor? This is a serial chip again. So this is the RS-232 network chip. Uh, and then under there is the microcontroller with the sticker over it and the programming port for programming. That is it. So there we have it. Uh, it's an interesting thing. The smart app, it, uh, it's dead. The servers are down. If you had that in your house, it will have reduced in functionality. And either way, I really don't recommend... I, I know people love the Internet of Things. They like being able to go into their bathroom and, say, flush the toilet, turn the light on, turn the shower, run a bath, uh, if you put the plug in. Does it put the plug into the bath, the plug hole? No, I doubt it. Anyway, uh, I know people want that, but to be honest, this is overcomplicating things to the point of just expensive gimmicks that will break down. Because if, say, for instance, a, a motor connection corroded away with a water ingress, then suddenly you'd lose control over one of the taps. Either it would stay open or it would stay closed. If the this failed, if it just crashed out, um, you might not be able to use your shower at all until you either, if you're a geek, if you're into plumbing and electrical yourself and the gadgets and connect to the internet, that's fine. You can do something about it. You can at least bridge things out and get things going. But to your average consumer, that would mean their whole shower and their bath and their sink were completely out of action until they'd got an Internet of Things specialist contractor in, and well, you know how expensive that's going to be. So it's worth mentioning at this point in time, 
this is not a new thing. The home automation has seen various disguises for the last several decades. I mean, in the 1980s, it was popular. But back then, all the wiring in your house, all the sockets and the lights, were all wired back with one cable each to a big, huge panel full of relays. And you had the serial interface and you had the remote buttons or a little control console. And it was very much what they're using for these days. It's to impress your friends, isn't it, really? And... Uh, Unfortunately, back then as well, the companies would go bust and there'd be no spare parts, no spare circuit boards available for it. And when that happened, you had a house all leading back to a dead panel with none of the relays active because the circuit board had failed, something had gone wrong. Unless you could find someone who knew what they were doing to fix that, hopefully just a power supply, then you basically had a unusable house until some, you couldn't it would take a complete rewire to actually bring it back to normal. Uh, so the Internet of Things is marginally better than that, but really don't automate your house too much. It's just a hiding to nothing. It's not a good idea. Also very insecure, uh, unless you particularly wish someone to be able to turn your shower on and off remotely from Russia or wherever. I just choose Russia since it's in fashion at the moment with its uh, hackers. But there we have it. Interesting thing, really nicely built. I mean, the person that built that, well, the people who built that did a good job. But it's just a kind of strangely vague product that might not find the market that they were expecting. Well, it didn't, did it? It's gone now.